Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 292, featuring the third of four installments with Mr. John Cutter, formerly of CinemaWare and Dynamics. In this part of the interview, we talk about his days at Dynamics, including, of course, his time uh, spent on the Betrayal at Crondor game, uh, what it was like working with Neil Hawford and uh, Raymond E. Feist on that, one of my favorite uh, classic role-playing games. Uh, we also talk about two failed projects, uh, Amen and Elysium, uh, great games, but uh, unfortunately got canceled before they uh, debuted, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But I think the most interesting part of this interview is a, a very uh, frightening uh, story uh, that John tells about one of the employees that he had the misfortune of working with. Uh, really gripping stuff, I'm sure you guys will... I don't know if enjoy is quite the right word, but I know you'll want to see it. So, uh, without further ado, here is Mr. John Cutter. So what was it like working with Neil at uh, Dynamics and working on Betrayal at Crondor? It was, uh, that was a pretty crazy project. Uh, Betrayal actually started out, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a quick kind of a, kind of a funny story. Uh, so Jeff Tunnell uh, called me, uh, made me the offer. I decided to come out and join, join Dynamics. And we had that classic, what do you want? He said, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. What do you want me to do? He said, no, you can do Sky's the Limit. What kind of game do you want to make? And I said, well, what kind of game do you need me to make? <laughs> so we had, had that back and forth for a little while. And then uh, I went off for about a week, and I came up with this crazy – story. The company, uh, we were owned by Sierra at the time, and of course they were known for their adventure games. The Dynamics had done uh, a few adventure games as well, and I thought, all right, well, I'm going to make an adventure game. It'd be great to do an adventure game about a tabloid news report, because then you could, you could go off and do any kind of crazy story. You know, my, my dachshund stole a jet airplane. You know, Fluffy was always such a friendly dog. You know, just do these crazy, weird stories about aliens and so I wrote this pitch document, and, and, I, and I dropped it off on Jeff's desk and, and left, and I was real excited about it. And as I was going back down to my office, I ran into a friend, and he said, so what, are you, what game are you doing? I said, oh, I had this great idea for an adventure game about this tabloid reporter, and, and I told him about it, and he said, well, that sounds exactly like Zach like McCracken. McCracken. <laughs> and I, oh, God, damn it. So I ran back up to try to quickly grab the proposal off, the, and the, I couldn't find it. So I'm rifling through all of these papers, and, and I was just getting ready to go through the drawer in Jeff's office when I looked up, and he was standing in the doorway with this kind of look on his face. And I thought I was going to get fired for sure, but I explained what was going on, and he had apparently taken the, the paper with him to read it somewhere. And so I grabbed it and said, don't read this, and went off. Um, shortly after that, he said, you know, I'm, I'm reading, you know, I don't really want you to do an adventure game. But I've been reading this fantasy series by Raymond Feist called The Rift War Saga. Uh, and I, I think it'd make a pretty good game. And he gave me a copy of one of the books, and I read it. And I thought, God, that was amazing. Yeah, this would make a, this would make a fantastic game. So I called Ray's, uh, Ray Feist's agent and found out how much money he actually makes. I thought, okay, well, that's not happening. We can't afford, afford that. But he uh, called back and said, hey, well, I'm interested maybe in working on a game with you guys. And so that's, that's how that happened. And then again, once I knew that we were making a very heavy story-based game, I knew that I needed Neil. So uh, I hired Neil away from, from New World. So you didn't, did you ever work with, uh, with Ray on the game, or did he give you feedback on it? Uh, Ray was pretty hands-off with, with the initial game. Um, Neil and I came up with a storyline. Uh, Neil did you know, 98% of the writing in the game and the scripting, and he did all the low-level design. And when we were done, we had a great big thick design document and kind of a story treatment, and we sent it all to Ray to get his approval on it. And Ray circled a lot of stuff and gave us a lot of notes. And, you know, some of it was pretty harsh. You know, this is stupid. Why would you do that? And a lot, I noticed a lot of the complaints that he had about the writing. I remember I had written, I'd added uh, some kind of a crazy... Um, poem at one point, uh, and it it used something about I can't remember what it what it was, but it was pretty bad. And Ray circled that, and most of the stuff that he circled, I, I found out later was things that I had written that he didn't like. So I let let Neil do most of the writing of the game. 
Um, but he gave us a lot of great notes, and we took all those notes. And then I don't think he really saw the game until he joined us at one of the trade shows, uh, probably CES, which is E3 now, um, to show to show the game off. And he, he really liked it. He really, really liked it. Yeah, I read the novel that he wrote about the, the game. What do you call it? It was Condor the Betrayal, I think. was. Or did he flip it, flipped it around, right, for his title? Yeah. Did, did you ever read that? Uh, I think I did. Yeah, I think I did read through it. And it was kind of nice that he, he actually called out uh, Neil and, and myself in the, uh, I think he may have dedicated the book to us or something. Yeah, that was he, nice. Yeah, that was a nice shout out in the, in the in- yeah. intro to that. I forget what he said. I think he said you were, he, wanted, he gave you credit for the idea for the game or something like that in there. So. Yeah. Well, again, the story really was, was something that, that Neil and I came up with. Of course, based in based in Ray's universe. Yeah, here's the box copy. Back when games had nice big boxes like this. Yeah. So this one, the it's got a little sticker here that says "Best Fantasy Role Playing Adventure Game, 1993." Yeah, that was that was a fun project. It uh, it was pretty scary. Uh, I made some design decisions in there that I was so concerned about. As we were getting close to, to finishing the game up, I I almost took my name off of the box and out of the box. <laughs> wow, was, why? What? I just it wasn't well there were there were some It was based on a flight stuff. simulator technology, right? Well yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I had originally wanted to do more of a two D game, but everybody thought that we should use the flight sim engine and, and do something in three D. And I think Ultima Underworld came out during the development of our game, which kind of helped support the idea that, yeah, 3D was the right choice here. Um, but I remember we, we digitized a lot of the actors. Uh, and we assumed when we were taking pictures and digitizing them that they were going to be so pixelated that, that the makeup and the costumes didn't really have to look that great. They just kind of had to be close. Uh, but I think before we launched the game, the technology improved and... The, yeah, the, you could see the elastic bands on the fake, you know, beards, and it was just, it was, it was pretty bad. So I wasn't crazy about a lot of the graphics in the game, and I had made this this decision that we wanted the game. Neil and I had made this decision. We wanted the game to feel like a novel. So you have certain characters in the first chapter, and some of those characters go away for the second chapter. And I thought people don't want to play a role playing game where you build up these characters. And then suddenly they go away and you can't play them anymore. Even though that was an idea that I was particularly excited about, I got, I got very nervous. I got cold feet uh, late in development that, what was I thinking? People are going to hate this. And I don't, think I, heard a, I don't think I heard a single negative comment about that particular feature. Uh, I, knew, I knew we were onto something, uh, I think, when, the, when our testers, our internal testers, um, started staying late to play the game to just get a little bit further. Uh, the other, the other thing that we did, and I think this was sort of a mistake on my part as the producer, um, we were using uh, some beta testers, some focus testers, or not focus, but beta testers uh, that were outside the company. And I thought we were closer to launching. When we were about three months away from, from what I thought our launch date was going to be, we started sending the game out for people to look at it. And as it turns out, it was probably uh, nine months before we actually launched the game. So we had a very extended period uh, of, of people looking at the game and sending us comments. And a lot of the comments, when we would get them back, we would kind of go, well, that's not that important. Uh, and so we'd write it off and other things we would fix. But when we started seeing the same comments over and over and over again, the programmers finally said, you know what? I'm tired of shoving this, you know, this comment somewhere else. Let's just fix it and people will stop complaining about it. So I think by the time the game came out, it was... It was a lot of those issues, those niggling issues and the, the bugs, I think, were, were gone. And I think that really helped the game a lot. Hmm. I always liked the magic system in that in that game. Is that your I think I had a big uh, hand. Design? Yeah. Uh, there was a guy named uh, Bob Lindstrom who uh, I think was running product development at the time. And we were, I don't know, four or five months away from shipping. And he said, you know, I like the magic system, but your interface doesn't feel magical enough. And, I, and after I thought about it, I agreed with him. So that's when we actually redid our, our UI. We put the little globes in, and we added the special effects like having, you know, when you give an item to somebody, it kind of goes into the globe and sort of sinks down. 
and and I think it was at that point that we added um, the kind of the little morphing lines when you would cast a spell. So yeah, some of that, some of the some of the polish I think was came about because Bob Lindstrom had suggested it. And was there any discussion about making it a real time combat? No, I had always liked uh, liked the turn based combat. Um, looking at it now, it feels it feels pretty crude. But uh, I used to love a game called Archon. Uh, oh back yeah, in- another great. Classic. And I just I wanted a game that kind of almost felt like it was being played out on a grid, and you're moving the characters around, and uh, so that's that's kind of where the combat came from, and the the little puzzles, which didn't work out quite as well as I was hoping. Yeah, I got Archon here behind me. I don't probably can't okay. see that. <laughs> yeah, it's like we have very similar tastes in games, which yeah doesn't surprise me. Right, let me think. I think I got. Is there anything else about Betrayal at Crondor that we haven't talked about? Uh, I do have sort of a, a, a funny story that came out of Betrayal at Crondor. Um, I'm not going to mention any names here to sort of protect the guilty, but uh, there was a person on the team that was was a little difficult to get along with. Uh, kind of scary, actually. Um, and this person, when they when they uh, left the company, um, they called me on the on the telephone. This was maybe a few weeks before Christmas. Called me on the telephone and said, you know, look, I just, you know, and I, I think I had an unlisted phone number at the time, so I'm not sure how uh, he even got my number. But he called me up. He said, you know, hey, I just want you to know that I'm, you know, I've left the company now, but I'm I'm not going to go all postal or anything. He's like, okay, thank you for calling me. And I hung up. And maybe he was, he, this guy would come in and scream at Neil and I for no reason. And then come back 10 minutes later, I'm so sorry, I was yelling. I just, I get so upset. And, you know, veins are, my head just is pounding. And almost like an abusive you know, husband kind of a situation that he would, he would scream and yell and, and then apologize for it later. And, and try to make sure that hey, everybody's fine. No, we're good. Everything's good. And then he would turn right around and do it again, you know, a week later. Uh, anyway, so he's gone. It's right around Christmas time. Uh, I'm sitting in the living room watching television. It's late at night. It's probably 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And all of a sudden, from the front door, I hear this scratch. And I thought, what? Is there an animal out there? So I, I kept hearing it. And I got up and I walked over to the door. And I was expecting, you know, if it was a, a dog or a cat wanting to get in the house for some reason, the scratching would be coming from, you know, down low. But no, it's like eye level scratch, the scratch. And so I turned the lights on, hoping that would scare whoever it was away. And of course, I knew it was this guy who was just waiting out there, getting ready to kill me. Uh, and it just it kept happening. I was turning the lights on and off and started talking. And my wife came out of the bedroom and, and I don't know what woke her up, but she, she saw me, and my face probably was just white as a ghost. And she's like, what's wrong? I said, I think there's somebody outside. And I don't know what got into her head, but she walks over to the door before I could say or do anything and throws the door open. And it was the Christmas wreath that we had hung up on the door that day, blowing in the wind back and forth. <laughs> just about gave me a heart attack though I almost lost it when she threw that door open I don't know what got into her mind I couldn't even tell her not to I just I was so scared yeah that was a bad situation this guy Wait, must it, have really been a been a uh, head case yeah he <laughs> wore a black jacket into into the office every day and I found out later that people uh, other artists when they found out on days that they were going to have to work with him uh, would call in sick that day they just did not how did want he to... even get the job there uh yeah it had a very good resume uh and the first time that he blew up at me i remember i went into uh uh a manager his manager and just said look this is not gonna work out. oh no no everything and he kind of put a band-aid on it and i just you know we were in eugene oregon uh at dynamics and i thought if i leave this company i'm gonna have to move there are no other game companies in this area I'm just going to have to figure out a way to, to work with this guy. And, and we did. And I, you know, overall, I think he did a good job. He just, it was, it was difficult at times. He wasn't, he wasn't from Australia, was he? 
No. Okay. <laughs> well, so after, uh, now after I guess you left Dynamics, you worked, I'm not sure exactly how long, but you uh, worked for Cave Dog Entertainment for a while? Yes. I guess you must have met uh, Chris Taylor there. Uh, yeah, Chris Taylor and Ron Gilbert. Um, I didn't work directly with Chris there, although I think he was in the office next to me and we, we used to chat a lot. They were making Total Annihilation at the time. Um, I didn't really have anything to do with TA, but um, he would come in. We'd bounce ideas off each other a little bit sometimes. Yeah, he was... Chris is, uh, is, uh, is a crazy guy. He is very charismatic and bigger than life. Yeah, I just had a, one of my favorite interviews was with him, and it was uh, right around that time. You remember when he was doing that Wild Man Kickstarter yeah. project, and that wasn't going too well. And, you know, he just really, you know, you could just really see the passion in this. You know, it wasn't just business for him. You know, he was he was got really kind of emotional, and you know, I get a little choked up watching the watching it myself. You know, you just tell this is a really great guy. Yeah. So did you do some work on Dungeon Siege 2? I did. Uh, so you, you had mentioned Cave Dog. Um, I actually worked, I hired Neil again uh, at Cave Dog to work on a, a game which unfortunately never got released called Elysian. It was a uh, an episodic game set in a dream world. And the idea was is that I, I wanted to put little uh, CD-ROMs like up by uh, the cash register at game stores that would have the next installment of the game. And the, the goal was, or maybe something you could download over, over the internet, which it just kind of was just coming into, into its own. Um, I wanted to have all of the components and pieces sort of in the initial uh, installation of the game. And then uh, we would just use those as, as data. We would, we would sort of upload or make these little data files available uh, to tell new stories within the same universe. Um, and we had all these, Neil had did a great job coming up with all these crazy stories sort of set in this world. And, uh, sci-fi channel was even interested in making a, a TV show about it. Wow. Um, I was also producing and, uh, producing a game called Amen, the Awakening, uh, with John Maver, who is now working with Bob Barry, who I also met, um, at Cave Dog at, uh, Uber Entertainment. And they did, um, well, they've done a bunch. I don't know if you're familiar with Uber. They've done a done a bunch of games over over there. Um, what happened to this Elysian project? Why was it canceled? Uh it was it was behind schedule. Um, and Ron Gilbert called me into his office one day. Uh, we've been working on it for a couple of years actually, and said, "You know, this whole Dream World RPG thing. I'm not sure I really get it." Uh, and so they, they canceled it that day and, and fortunately didn't fire me. I got to continue working there for a while and pitch some other ideas I was pretty excited about. But uh, Cave Dog eventually, well, actually Cave Dog and Kabungus kind of kind of imploded. Uh, so that's why I left there. That's a little sad. I guess Ron just wasn't feeling it, huh? No, uh, I wish he would have told me two years earlier. It was, uh, I think a lot of it was, it was just, it was very slow. Um, it was one of the first big 3D games that I had worked on, um, and I think as a producer, I'm a really good game designer, so I, I probably dropped the ball a little bit on the, on the producing side. all for this week's episode i hope you guys enjoyed that i should be back next week with uh, one final installment uh, with the uh, awesome mr john cutter so stay tuned for that uh, after these are done we'll do another retrospective and then we'll uh, start the richard bartle series of mud fame so lots of great stuff lots of wonderful things look to uh, look forward to and i really appreciate you guys making it all possible thank you thank you guys Thank you for supporting the show. Uh, by the way, if you would like to support the show, actually, there's a couple different ways. Uh, one, of course, you can go to the Patreon site in the show notes, a really awesome site. I do say so myself. And you can uh, subscribe to the show at any level that you want to. 
a dollar, hey, that works. Uh, Five dollars, even better. Uh, Ten, uh, hey, why not? You know, it's all up to you, whatever you can afford and what you feel the show is worth. So thank you, everybody. Uh, if you don't want to support the show financially, or you can't, or maybe you are and you just want an additional way to be awesome, I'm really uh, needing people to uh, post reviews of the gameplay movie. Uh, that's a movie that I uh, co-produced with old uh, Bill LeJudas for Luke's Digital Pictures. Uh, apparently, it's making a, it's a pretty big deal that the uh, iTunes store gets some uh, reviews posted. I don't think actually I have to write anything. Uh, just give it a star rating, I think, is sufficient. Uh, but anyway, apparently it's really holding the show back, uh, not having these reviews. So I know a lot of you guys aren't on iTunes. You don't care about iTunes. and <laughs> You know, I can understand why, but uh, please just take a couple minutes if you have an iTunes account. You know, it doesn't, it's not like it costs you anything. And uh, post a review of that, and I would really appreciate that. All right, news from the Matt Cave. So there's a lot of great news uh, for this week. Uh, first off, I finally got around to watching this movie from uh, Bedrooms to Billions. I funded these guys on Kickstarter and I got my DVD and it so kind of sat around for about a month. I was just so busy. Finally got to, uh, to watch this thing and I can say without any equivocation at all, if you like Mad Chat, you're going to want to own, own this. It's well worth it. It was, I thought I knew a lot about uh, games history. But I really didn't appreciate how different things were in the UK and really how awesome they were. I think uh, we kind of missed out here in the US in several ways. Uh, anyway, go check this out. I know you're going to love it. I'll put some links uh, in the show notes to it. Uh, but anyway, those guys did a really great job. And uh, hey, you know, they deserve all the sales they get. Uh, second item, the Serpent in the Staglands uh, project is now uh, live. You might remember I had Joe and Hannah on this show. Really great interview, really great people. They even sent me the uh, leather-bound journal, uh, which, by the way, has already proven uh, useful in getting me past some imp riddles. So I've been playing, the, I probably only played that game maybe uh, four or five hours so far. Really enjoying it, though. I do have to say, <laughs> man, is it tough. Whew. Oh, man. So another bit of news, Nathan and Becca sent me a really awesome gift. Uh, this is the ACA 620EC expansion card for the Amiga 600. And, you know, I've had that Amiga 600 for a while, but uh, as you know, the stock uh, 600 is lacking some functionality, specifically with the cool, uh, I think it's, uh, was it WHD load, a few other cool uh, things I weren't, wasn't able to do properly until now, uh, thanks to Nathan and Becca. Uh, so what I'm planning to do is once I get this installed, I had to actually order some special screwdrivers. I didn't have that uh, torque or Torx or whatever you call it. Uh, so anyway, that's on its way. So once I get all the equipment I need, uh, I will put this in and I want to do a little uh, Patreon uh, supporter video uh, for this card because I know a lot of you guys are into the uh, Amiga 600, so you might want to see that. Let's see, other news, of course, uh, Kung Fury is out. I know a lot of you guys supported that. I've been getting uh, lots of uh, Facebook uh, messages and tweets about it. Haven't watched it myself, uh, but I'm very curious uh, what you think. I'm sure I'll probably watch it uh, tomorrow. And then uh, finally, Stig sent me a piece of news about a graphic novel based on the Baldur's Gate series. That's uh, It's called Dungeons and Dragons Legends of Baldur's Gate Volume 1. You know, I don't know anything about it other than that at the moment. Uh, if you are a graphics novel fan and a Baldur's Gate fan, or maybe you already, maybe already have it, uh, let me know what you think. All right, I think that will do it for the news. And I'm very, very thirsty. Uh, so that probably means it's a good time for the Ale of the Week. I need a little theme music for the Ale of the Week, you know? All right, what do I got? Well... This week I've got a little number called the Worthy Adversary. This is from Fulton Brewery out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, so sorry guys, I don't know what kind of uh, distribution these guys have, uh, but uh, you never know, you might be able to find this somewhere. Ordinary guys brewing extraordinary beer. I like their, their message there. Worthy Adversary, an unchecked aggression of dark flavors 
This rich stout is about drawing a line in the sand. <laughs> You know, this is probably the perfect ale to be drinking when you're playing Serpent in the Staglands, or as I like to call it, uh, Rodent in the Matlands. Uh, I think they, <laughs> uh, let's see, alcohol, 9.5% by volume, so uh, that's actually uh, definitely on the stronger side. That is uh, really, really strong. Uh, I think I might have had a few stronger than that, uh, courtesy of old, uh, of old uh, Herb. <laughs> I almost blinked on your name there, Herb. Hey, like, that, that, that's a sign of how strong that beer was you sent. Um, let's see. Complexity, approachability, can and should, blah, 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 blah. Uh, passion, brood, blah, blah. 10% of profits invested in the folio fund. I don't know what the folio fund is, but I guess it's kind of cool if these guys are... Uh, kicking a little back to charity. Anyway, it looks good and I need this, so let's get the worthy adversary open and into the drinking horn. All right, so I got some of this worthy adversary here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> Smells really, really, <laughs> really nice. Uh, we've got a kind of a cherry, chocolatey, a little bit of a blueberry uh, flavor, uh, aroma to this. It smells really good. A little bit of a cocoa, a kind of a chocolatey thing going on. It's kind of a, you know, I just had some uh, raspberry cheesecake last night. For some reason, it's kind of reminding me of that. It had a lot of a chocolate and raspberry flavor. Yeah, just, it smells really, really good. I don't know who uh, would not want to drink this after smelling it. Uh, they really nailed the aroma, uh, so let's give it a taste. <clears throat> well, you definitely get some bitterness uh, with this one. A very sort of dark chocolate. You know, have you ever had that really bitter uh, dark chocolate? That's kind of what it tastes like. A little bit of a coffee flavor. Actually, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that uh, Hershey's cocoa. You know, if you ever uh, just tried a little bit of that by itself. Uh, not bad. A little bit of that sort of a peanut, uh, toasted peanut kind of a flavor there. Uh, Basically very nutty and chocolatey uh, like flavor here, a bit of a coffee. Now I'll try it again. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, really, really good stuff. You definitely taste some bitterness, but you know, it's, it goes kind of away and then you get that sort of chocolatey uh, aftertaste of this. It's actually quite good. I'm just gonna try it one more time here, see if I can pick up uh, any additional flavors. Now, I think that's, that's probably going to do uh, to do it there. You get the chocolate, you get the coffee, you get a little bit of a, a sort of toasted uh, nut-like flavor to this. A really, really good. Uh, I have no problem at all giving this one a full five out of five. Drinking horns are really tasty, but uh, with that 10.5 or whatever it was percent alcohol, you definitely want to uh, be careful with it. Uh, don't drink too many, or you might end up like a certain Matt Chad producer. Anyway, let's wrap this up with a uh, quotation. And I was looking for uh, quotations about fear. And I found one that I thought was really, really cool uh, from uh, Plato. The <laughs> well, you know who Plato is, I hope. Anyway, it goes something like this. We can forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy is when men are afraid of the light. See you guys next week. Me? I'm as dumb as they come.